stage, uh, Howard Cooper. Howard, if you want to come on down. Hopefully we got you mic'd up all right here. If I get a round of applause for Howard here. The first event we went to in Toronto was an Opal Financial event, and uh, Howard was one of the keynote speakers. And, you know, it's always tough being the new guy on the block. And, you know, I get a chance to kind of see what's going on. It's a whole new group of people. And, uh, Howard, I just want to thank you. You were very warm. You were very welcoming. Uh, you gave great remarks. And you were encouraging us to continue on, to be involved. Uh, you saw something in Kretsu, Kretsu Capital, that you thought, you know, could be a benefit in terms of bringing them together. You subsequently introduced us to other family office organizations, and as we've learned, you're, you're very involved in many, many different groups, so we appreciate all your perspective. Uh, welcome to Seattle, and uh, we're great to be able to get things uh, kicked off here with our discussion. So, uh, our topic today is the growing family office appetite for early stage venture. Uh, so if you could, why don't you just take a couple minutes, kind of introduce yourself, your background. Welcome to Seattle, love to have you here. Uh, why don't you share a little bit about uh, your story, how you came to form, and be part of the, the Cooper family office, would be great. Thank you, David. Um, and thank you to Maggie for finding a search of the online that's from 10 years ago. I really appreciate that. Um, uh, my background, uh, very quickly, was I was an equities trader for 25 years, just on my own behalf, as the source of family assets. Uh, left direct trading at the end of 07, uh, moving mostly cash at that time, waiting for what I thought would be an imminent and great buying opportunity that was not as imminent as I expected. And uh, after spending 25 years sitting in a trading room watching every tick in the market, decided that was enough. Uh, had set up a family office in 2006 for the benefit of my kids who were not going to be equities traders. Uh, and we began uh, early 08, late, uh, late 08, early 09. Uh, began moving into alternatives, originally very liquid hedge fund uh, strategies, and then we started going a little bit more liquid, moving into some private equity, uh, and had a lot more fun on the private equity side, and found out the returns could be uh, far greater on private equity uh, over time. Built out a great team of people, uh, a mistake that way too many family offices make. I've talked about this to many of you here, uh, are being uh, very cheap on uh, the hiring or bringing in professionals, and that's a mistake. Amazing talent pays for itself many times over. Uh, so we now have 12 people on the investment side, a combination of impressive MBAs, PhDs, MDs, uh, attorneys, and so forth, uh, which through that has given us the ability to start moving into venture. Uh, and uh, special thank you to Nathan for uh, over the years introducing me to a few companies and sort of helping us get started on this. Uh, our, our first effort was a company called Uber that's done pretty well so far. Uh, so pretty happy in that, and sometimes a little success leads to some greater failures, but um, in the last half dozen years, we've started doing more in the venture space. And um, so to take us to where we are today, uh, venture is still a relatively small, maybe 2% of what we do. I absolutely want to take that in the coming years to uh, probably 15 or 20% of assets. And I know we're going to talk about that, but seeing that among other families as well. So family offices traditionally have a lot of good coverage with traditional financial advisors, but when they're making the jump to you know private direct investing, it's a, it's a whole other world. We talked about the strength of the team, but what are really the drivers? You talked about some of the drivers for yourself and your family. Do you see that trend continuing? And what's been your discussions with the other family offices, both North American and, and global, about their their interest in you know what's really driving that? Uh, demand appetite for, for early stage venture? Uh, it's, it's really just begun. Um, I have no doubt that in the next couple of years, the amount of money that's going to be coming into venture, and specifically to an earlier stage venture, is, is just going to be phenomenal. Globally, um, I have a number of family office friends in China. I'm there once a year. Uh, Chinese families are used to, and I'm not kidding, 30 to 50% annualized returns. Uh, they prefer doing private equity. They prefer venture. And they want to take huge amounts of money and bring it into the United States, as do families out of South America, the rest of Asia, and Europe. Uh, not necessarily for a good reason, they just see all the opportunities being in the United States and there's kind of no place else to go, but be that as it may, uh, the trillions that will be coming into the United States with families all around the world is phenomenal. Uh, and the greatest interest there, certainly in real estate and certainly in public equities, but a tremendous amount of that is going into private equity and venture, and now more and more trickling into early stage venture. Uh, a good part of the reason for that, I think families pursuing earlier stage venture now, 
is getting lost on too high a valuation on later stage venture, um, getting stuck in lockups and things of that sort. And I think more than anything, um, by way of an example, in our family office now, we have a number, we have a few venture funds, but a greater amount of capital is going directly into individual, individual companies. Um, in the last five years or so, we put money into th over 30 individual companies, um, in earlier, earlier to mid-stage. Uh, in a half a dozen of those, we've take, taken pretty active roles in the companies. Um, and uh, to that stage, uh, to that end, it's also been uh, helping with bringing in introductions on their family offices who might be investors, guidance and building out boards. The largest part of that has been introducing customers, um, ways that our team can help, uh, things along the, those lines. Um, I think, I think I, I'm sure that to a great extent, the family offices as opposed to the angel investors really like the opportunity of being very actively involved in the companies. And uh, uh, one of the areas where family offices can help probably a lot more is the simple fact that if we like the founder, if we like the company, um, as Nathan pointed out, unfortunately a lot of companies are still going to zero no matter what. Uh, some deserve to, but a lot get there simply because they can't raise the capital. If the company is good, if the management is good, if the idea is good, uh, it should not go to zero simply because it runs out of capital. Um, so in those cases, either a single family or a few family offices banding together can raise the capital that's needed. And if that doesn't work, if it's a great company, we will buy the company. Uh, so if it's if the companies, the family offices can see to it or can help ensure the fact that if a company is going to fail simply because they can't get the capital run that they need, that could be accomplished for a good company. We've seen a lot of that with our portfolio companies, probably 50 of which now have a family office on the cap table and having that balance sheet behind the company it just kind of takes that, that edge off a little bit as these companies are obviously always looking for capital and having that extra strength behind them has been a, a real plus and help them. The confidence of the company kind of goes up a level and their performance has also done well. So as family also looking to allocate, obviously they've got a couple of choices. They can continue to put more money with fund managers that are extremely successful like the Sequoias of the world that already have a wait list for capital. You know, how are they deploying uh, in terms of funds vis-a-vis -vis setting up their own structure to be able to do direct investing? And what's kind of the trend these days? Is there the ability for them to allocate through venture or is really the growth in terms of what they want to do more of, you know, what share of that is going to be through funds versus them wanting to set up the capacity to do direct investing? Uh, nobody likes to pay fees on top of everything else, bottom line, whether family office or anybody else. Uh, there's a tendency more and more toward middle and larger sized family offices to very much go to the extreme of wanting to build their own portfolio of companies and direct individually, such as what uh, Nathan, what you sort of uh, inspire or suggest. Uh, you'll definitely see the smaller, it, it, it takes a lot of due diligence. I mean, a bottom line for us to do diligence in an individual company with our people's time runs twenty to $40,000. An initial call runs a couple of thousand dollars. These are people who are paid extremely well. Uh, they do great work, and it's a necessary part of things, but for a small family office or a high net worth, uh, having to look at dozens or a hundred or a couple hundred companies in a year is just not feasible. Uh, so they will stay um, with, I think, with the fund structure, the co fund structure. Uh, Mid-sized to larger families, very, very definitely going toward investing directly in the companies as well. Company, you know, again, coming where do you see the break point? When you say small versus large for the audience here, they may not really have a, a sense of the magnitude in terms of kind of the, the breakdowns in terms of the, the family office ecosystem, in terms of obviously billionaire family offices, groups that have hundreds of millions versus kind of on the, on the smaller end, maybe an entrepreneur has had an exit or two in the, in the 30 to $50 million range. Kind of where do you see that kind of demark line where, you know, it really makes sense for people to develop that infrastructure? Uh, difficult to answer, of course, uh, but uh, it, it is sort of commonly suggested now by some of the family office surveys uh, that a small app office is defined as under 500 billion, a mid-sized office of 500 billion to one and a half billion, and a large family office would be one and a half billion and beyond, uh, and a mega family office would be over 10 billion, and there's a growing number of those as well. Uh, to finish up on what I was talking about before, just along those lines, uh, 
as everybody here knows, uh, a lot of family offices know each other. I've been really fortunate to work with hundreds or associate with hundreds of family offices. Uh, we all share ideas constantly. I have regular conference calls on a weekly basis. Our team does with all different family offices all around the world. Uh, we're in constant touch with each other, certainly on funds, on venture funds, on private equity, on hedge funds, uh, discussing the pluses and the minuses. We share due diligence efforts. And what's happening more and more now is talking about individual companies. Uh, so while we've done the work on dozens of companies, uh, in, without fail, in every single one of the several dozen companies that we've invested in over the last few years, other family offices, at least one or two, and in some cases, eight or ten or more, have come in on some of those same names, and we've done that with some of the names therein. Uh, everybody has expertise in certain areas. So when you, and, and to your point, Nathan, when, when you've contacted or have been successful with having capital from one family office, whether it's a $100,000 check or a $10 million check from that family, uh, it is very likely going to lead to additional family offices coming in on that when they gain the comfort that somebody else has done some initial work that sees it. It's not a follow the leader mentality. They'll do what they need to do, uh, but a lot of us have respect for what each other does, and it is an ability to get additional sets of eyes looking at it. And we see the same dynamic in the in the angel community where, you know, a startup, once they get that lead angel investor who's done the due diligence, then obviously other angel investors are much more willing to take a look at and follow along. So it sounds like there's a, a similar dynamic, but maybe a little bit of a different spin on it. So as uh, entrepreneurs, obviously their ideal funding scenario, having multiple family offices backing their idea, I mean, that sounds just, you know, heavenly for most of the entrepreneurs that work so hard to build their companies and raise capital, build their companies and raise capital. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, the best way for, number one, the entrepreneurs to look to build relationships with family offices and, and you know, be able to efficiently be able to see if that's something that might work for them? Uh, as well as maybe comment, you know, a lot of angels are investing in companies and they obviously would love to get their portfolio companies exposed for family office funding. Uh, what's, what would you suggest in your experience as some, some good ways to, to build those connections and the time it takes to really get the relationship established to, to make it possible? Sure. Um, that, that is, of course, the most difficult part of things. An event like this is great. Um, uh, there are lists of family offices and things of that sort generally avoid those. Uh, the typical entrepreneur, this, uh, the founder here, you need to find the single family offices as opposed to, to multi-family offices. Uh, multi-family offices, by the nature of what they're doing, are running funds or running groups where they have product to sell or they have things they're doing and they're not going to take a chance on startups because while well, the returns for new people are probably the greatest, the potential returns are the greatest, the risk is also pretty hefty as well. Um, and I think what Nathan was talking about here is the ideal scenario is single family offices that band together or work together that are not charging fees to each other and that are working as friends and as groups as opposed to setting up structures uh, where they're actually competitors to each other. Uh, so that works and works well. Uh, it is difficult uh, to get through to uh, cold calling family offices. We get a lot of those. It's, it's just not going to get anywhere. There's way too many, and it can't be covered. Um, again, uh, aligning with a group like Koretsu that sort of has the initial contact with a lot of families is ideal. And once you get past that first hurdle of getting one or two family office investors, the floodgates do tend to open up if it is the right family over time, and, and we'll take you there. Uh, if there's a word of caution here, it's, it's be careful. There are a lot of people who are or essentially RAAs or, or um, third-party marketers who might represent themselves as family offices or working with family offices. And if they're just reaching out to you to represent you for a fee or something of that sort, uh, you're not getting anywhere. Yeah, we found that, you know, much like when the angel community was first coming together, there people tried a lot of things and some worked and, and, and most didn't. In the family office community, you know, we've had a chance to attend a whole variety of different events and and ways of putting things together and, and business models. It's been very much a frontier market, a lot of education, a lot of social, some very, very exclusive, you know, uh, some very nice locations, certainly, uh, compared to our startup accelerator type of uh, uh, accommodations, definitely uh, some levels up. Uh, so how do you see, uh, as the family office communities mature, there's more family office co-investment organizations and just relationships that establish us as this mandate, as this allocation expands, by definition, there's going to have to be, you know, more people coordinating deal flow and putting more deals together to be able to help that happen. 
Uh, how do you see it evolving? How do you see that capacity uh, growing? Uh, anything we should be on the lookout in terms of trends for the future here for uh, how we can you know, collaborate to make that happen? Uh, no question in my mind that the floodgates are just beginning to open with the amount of money that's going to be coming in from family offices now. In the, in the coming decade, I, I venture is going to be fueled more by family office investment than by anything else, including angels, including the VC funds. Um, again, for the reasons that they, well, the risk is clearly there. Uh, the added value of building a portfolio of startups makes a lot of sense to a lot of family offices, more so than using a fund that's charging two and 30, uh, putting together a portfolio of 30, why not just pick and choose the names you want, you know, follow sort of coming to an event like this and finding the names that we like the best, and, and building our own portfolio. Uh, the amount of money that will be coming that way is going to be staggering, and the ability to help build the companies is going to be amazing. Uh, to that end, uh, more and more, uh, on a formalized level, family offices are banding together in groups. We have, and, and nonprofit sort of clubs, we have a group in Palm Beach that gets together once a month uh, just to share ideas and to bring in presentations here and there. And people, you know, we have private discussions, does this make sense, where does it work, should we all work on building this company together? Uh, there are some other good events out there, as things of that sort, uh, things at universities that sort of make sense. Uh, but again, stay with the things that are very much more dedicated toward the single family office. Um, that is not necessarily a for-profit event, but trying to uh, sort of that, exactly what you're saying, the sort of sharing ideas, the joining together to share the due diligence efforts. So much like the angels, is it's usually in person and people meeting and, and you know, seeing what areas of interest, there's overlap, and then from that people pursue follow-on discussions and relationships. Uh, do you see this family office phenomenon also to be primarily event-driven, uh, you know, connecting together versus for instance, a lot of people try to set up online platforms. Uh, do you guys do anything with any of the online platforms, or do you see most of this being offline activity in terms of people being able to access family office investment? Uh, the online activity can be good, but uh, that's, uh, again, far more utilized by, uh, I, think, uh, I suspect, the angels and the high net worth. And, and from a founder's point of view, what difference does it make if you're getting capital from a family office or high net worth? Uh, to a certain extent. The family office is, again, going to be much more likely to introduce other family offices, might be much more better connected uh, through uh, political groups, uh, medical groups, business groups, everything else. I mean, uh, I will say to a certain extent through the families we know there are various <laughs> industries or businesses that we don't know through one or two degrees of separation, somebody that might get you in the door of the company that you're trying to reach out to. Uh, but as far as platforms, I think the family offices in the West like to use that, the high net worth, which a great group of people have as investors, are much more likely to use that. The family offices are much more likely to get it through sharing of things between them. Let's talk about kind of uh, the appetite, obviously investment direct, but in the what? We've got technology, we've got life science, we've got clean tech. You know, we'll hear today from a family office that's very focused on space technologies, literally the last frontier. Uh, some very exciting things that are coming up on our panels later today. Uh, what are some of the areas that you're seeing garner the most uh, interest, uh, attractive from the, the family offices that, that you guys are sharing deals with? What's, what's kind of getting the most attention these days in terms of the industry areas? Um, when you account for all family offices, the, the real answer is everything, uh, wherever there's potential. Uh, putting the term AI in front of every, anything is helpful. Uh, there is a very definite interest, certainly from our family, in medical devices, medical technology, biotech, uh, biotech anything of that sort. Uh, technology in general. I mean, within our family office, we've added uh, recently a guy who was a trader at Paulson, a great tech guy who came out of Michael Dell's family office, a physician by background as an oncologist, just because we're doing more and more in that space. In that space. Um, we have done everything from high tech to biotech to simple, old line, boring agriculture stuff. Uh, so the real genuine answer here is anywhere they see a potential. Uh, that's where the family is going to go. Fantastic. Well, again, thank you so much, Howard. We appreciate your guidance, your leadership, your mentorship as we've, you know, endeavored from the Kretsu community to, to understand family offices. How can we create a way to work with them as, as angel investors? We are very active uh, investing in, you know, 65 companies just in Q2 here, so we got a lot of work to do to fill out these follow-on rounds. So we're excited to work with you and 
your friends and colleagues here going forward and really appreciate you coming out to Seattle. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.